Good afternoon and welcome to Virtual Ability. I am Roxy Martin. I'm a teacher and presenter for Virtual Ability. I would like to welcome you to the third annual International Disability Rights Affirmation Conference, also known as DRAC, sponsored by Virtual Ability Incorporated. If anyone needs assistance during the conference, please instant message one of the Virtual Ability greeters who are standing in the aisles toward the back of the auditorium. If you are not familiar with our Virtual Ability community, please click the poster on stage to receive a note card or check out our website www.virtualability.org. To find out more about this conference, please look at the information here on the blog site virtualability.org. We would love to have you add comments about the sessions you have attended. The topic of this afternoon's session is Reflex Sympathetic Dystostrophy, open bracket, RSD, close bracket. This is a chronic condition that may or may not involve nerve damage, but is extremely painful. RSD is a rare and little understood condition that makes its sufferers feel isolated. Our speakers for this session are Dr. Nina Slota and Dr. Stephanie Jenkins. Dr. Slota is a professor at Northern State University, Aberdeen, South Dakota. She received her PhD from City University in New York in De Mel apologies, Developmental Psychology. Her current research interests include how adults living with reflex sympathetic dystrophy, how this experience affects their lives and identities, including how people with disabilities build communities. Dr. Jenkins is an assistant professor in the School of History, Philosophy and Religion at Oregon State University. She received her dual PhD in Philosophy and Women's Studies from Pennsylvania State University in 2012. Her research and teaching interests include 20th century continental philosophy with an emphasis on French, as well as feminist philosophy, disability studies, critical animal studies and ethics. Hello, we would like to thank the conference organizers for inviting us and spending their time teaching us to use Second Life. We are excited to be here to share our research and learn about this community. We're excited to be here. Both Nina and Stephanie find their way to disability studies a discipline which researches disability from the perspective of people with disabilities rather than the medical model, as, if, as individuals with RSD, open bracket, reflex, sympathetic, dystostrophy, close bracket. Unable to find any research about RSD that were incorporated disability studies methods, Stephanie emailed the listserv to see if anyone was working on RSD research. Nina responded, and that is how a philosopher and psychologist met online. Because we met online, it is fitting to present here too. Because we couldn't find any studies about RSD on the developing field of disability studies, we decided to create our own. Slide 3. Reflex Sympathetic Dystostrophy, also known as Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, is a progressive chronic pain condition that produces severe pain, swelling and skin changes. The syndrome usually affects one of the extremities, beginning in a hand.
Later stages of the syndrome may include irreversible, apologies, irreversible bone changes and muscle atrophy. While the etiology of the disease is unknown, its occurrence is typically preceded by injury or surgery. There is no cure for reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Open brackets hereafter RSD. Close brackets. Treatment strategies are directed towards pain management and relief. The methods used are both biomedical and psychological. Slide 4. Here we have included a picture of a severe example of RSD. This individual's right arm, which is extremely swollen and bright red. We should note, however, that not all cases exhibit symptoms this extreme. Slide 5. Pain is an embodied, Pain is an embodied experience. However, pain narratives are typically framed within the trajectory of healing. Pain is temporary. Intervention of modern medicine cures the pain. Chronic pain, however, disrupts this series of events. As Alien Pain disrupts the world, the everyday coherence of life, self and experience of an individual. The pain is so severe it is unspeakable because it is the unmaking of all meaning. The body, instead of being a source of agency, becomes an obstacle to action. More significantly, the body in pain disrupts an individual's sense of self. Because his or her life plans, the understanding of goals, actions and movement become impossible and unpredictable. Because the individual with chronic pain doesn't fit the usual narrative of a sick person who eventually heals, other people may be skeptical of the quote realness unquote of the pain. Feeling disconnected from others, the individual becomes socially isolated when the usual social supports fail. Slide 6. Why should scholars of disability be interested in RSD? Although biomedical literature has labelled RSD open quote, disabling close quote, because the severity of its pain inhibits full participation in society, we have been unable to locate research within disability studies on this chronic condition. It is not merely the empirical lacuna, however, that makes RSD significant for disability studies. As a chronic pain condition, RSD offers an opportunity for thinking about the relationship between impairment, pain, and identity. RSD is the prototype of chronic pain because its main symptom is pain itself.
While academic research models and funding methods necessitate the use of biomedical diagnostics, studying RSD may help us learn about chronic pain in ways that will benefit individuals with other conditions and sources of pain. RSD provides an opportunity for studying the potential for collective identity organized around impairment in a way that requires moving beyond the social model of disability. However, we realize that many chronic illnesses, such as lupus, include chronic pain as part of their illness experience. For this presentation, we are looking at RSD as a syndrome in which pain is the primary condition. Symptom, apologies. Slide 7. Chronic pain is a common disability. Disability studies examine how non-normative bodies and minds are defined and represented in society. It rejects the biomedical model which treats bodily difference as pathology. Consequently, medical research is removed from the needs, concerns and experience of those who are disabled because disability is medicalized as illness or impairment requiring a cure. Rather than addressing questions of justice, albeit bias or healthcare access, topics often examine how disabilities can be prevented, cured, or exterminated. Disability Studies open bracket DS, close bracket, is an interdisciplinary field using method from disciplines such as political science, literature, cultural studies, philosophy, gender studies, and more. In an effort to eradicate negative depictions of the disabled as crippled or deformed, Disability theorists have transitioned from a medical to a social model of disability, open bracket, although this is not the only model used in DS, close bracket. For DS scholars like us, the open quote problem, close quote, of disability is not persons with disabilities, as Leonard Davis argues, but the open quote way that normalcy is constructed to create the problem of the disabled person." Close quote. The drive to demythicalize disability, according to disability theorist and feminist philosopher Susan Wendell, bifurcates disability and illness because some advocates believe that associating disability with illness contributes to the myth that people with disabilities are incapable, incapacitated and in need of a cure. Analysis informed by the social model which views prejudice, social injustice and institutional oppression as the causes of disability. Often ignore or are unable to account for the experiences of individuals with what Wendell terms open quote unhealthy close quote disabilities open quote whose bodies are highly medicalized because of their suffering, their deteriorating health or the threat of death close quote. While the open quote disability pride close quote movement has facilitated individuals fashioning of their own disability identities and communities, this pride presumes a transition from the biomedical model of disability, which considers disability 
as biological error in need of medical correction, to the social model which views disability as the result of social injustice. But we're, we're at that place, aren't we? <laughs> I will just recap the previous paragraph as well, since we've had a little gap. Okay. While the disability pride movement has facilitated individuals fashioning of their own disability identities and communities, this pride presumes the transition from the biomedical model of disability, which considers disability as biological error in need of medical correction to the social model which views disability as the result of social injustice. But if the social model requires a critique of the biomedical model, can disability pride include pride in pain? If it is not possible to have pride in pain, if pain is always experienced as a negative, advocates for individuals with healthy disabilities may have vastly different agendas and aims than those for individuals with open quote, unhealthy, close quote, disabilities. For this reason, we investigate how individuals with chronic pain experience their pain and how that pain implicates their identities as sick, disabled, or something else. We believe that disability studies must investigate and theorize open quote, unhealthy close quote, disabilities in addition to open quote, healthy close quote, ones. Only by studying the full range of disability will it be possible to understand the diversity of human embodiment and the underpinnings of able-bodied norms. RSD is one such unhealthy disability. Slide 8. RSD pain is disabling because the severity of its pain disrupts the normal routines of an individual's daily life. Individuals report that they can't open quote do close quote their regular lives, or even that life has become a open quote, living hell, close quote. Because individuals with RSD are often socially isolated from other people with disabilities, their support network rarely includes anyone who can sympathize with their pain. They can view themselves as a burden to their able-bodied loved ones, and unfortunately, these relationships often break down over time. Slide 9. Other social factors contribute to disability with RSD. Medical experts, who have often never learned about RSD, can be condescending and paternalistic when individuals with chronic pain seek treatment. Because RSD pain is so severe, it is often
However, because chronic pain doesn't follow the timeline of a medical cure, individuals are accused of drug seeking, being difficult patients, or malingering. The lack of public awareness about chronic pain means that doctors expect their patients to fit into the social scripts of the sick role or the super crypt who overcomes his slash her disability. When this does not happen and a medical intervention fails to cure the pain, doctors may come to see the patient as the problem. Slide 10. Our study examines the life experiences of individuals with RSD. We are interested in whether and how the experience of chronic pain serves as the basis for forming a collective identity. Is pain a potential organizing force? Slide 18. The disability resulting from apologies, I will go back. To this end, we asked we asked questions about the daily lives of individuals with RSD, their gender identity, the kinds of accommodations they use in their environments, and their engagement in political activism. Slide 18. Disability resulting from RSD's chronic pain creates problems of accessibility. In order to have access to pain medications, individuals need health coverage. They may, they may also need wheelchairs or other supports to move about in the built environment. Their homes, arranged prior to their development of RSD, may be hard to navigate. resulting in mobility problems or the ability to use facilities including bathrooms and kitchens. Public spaces may become less accessible for the same reason. Even in spaces that meet ADA requirements, the pain itself can inhibit an individual's ability to leave the home, as lighting and changes in temperature can be triggers. Slide 11. Our questionnaire has five main parts which are Consent, Demographics, Daily Life, Disability Identity, and Gender Identity. The Demographics section included questions about medical demographics and service usage. Daily Life included asking participants about their good days and bad days. Gender identity included questions about their attitudes and activism around gender issues. Similarly, disability identity included RSD activism, but it also included questions about social support number of acquaintances with RSD, as well as knowledge about the ADA. We distributed our internet question by posting the link on various RSD Foundation websites, as well as to RSD support groups on Yahoo and Facebook. Depending on the website, we either wrote to the group leader and asked them to post, or to give us permission to post, or we simply posted the link ourselves. It depended on the website's rules. Stephanie also posted the link on her Facebook page. Believe it or not, Nina has never done Facebook. We both also sent copies of our flyer to our various doctors.
As a disability accommodation, we also gave out Nina's work phone number so that people who couldn't use the computer could still participate. Nina conducted five interviews in this manner. Slide 12. Next, let me describe our sample. We had 173 respondents, but for today we are focusing on the 148 females. Not every person answered every question, so the numbers may not always add to 148. The age range was 18 to 68, with an average of 46.7 years. RSD tends to hit middle-aged females and has been shown to have a 3.5 to 1 ratio of males to females. Therefore, our sample is fairly typical. Slide 13. This is a further breakdown of the age distribution. There is an increase from 7 participants between the ages of 25 to 29, up to 28 participants between 50 and 50. It then dips to 18 people between 55 to 59, and then increases again to 24 people over age 60. Again, this represents the typical profile of women with RSD. Slide 14. Our sample was predominantly white with 88.5% of our population describing themselves as Caucasian or white. Eight people didn't answer, two participants were black or African American, and two described themselves as multiracial. One participant each was Jewish, Mennonite, Korean American, East Indian, or Hispanic. This probably reflects the so-called, open quote, digital divide Close quote, between the various American racial and or ethnic groups. In the future, one way to get around this would be to do a phone call or postal survey instead of an online survey. Slide 15. With RSD, time since symptom onset or injury may be much longer than time since diagnosis due to doctors' ignorance and or lack of access to definitive medical tests. Therefore, while we collected both pieces of information, for this talk we are highlighting time since its symptom onset. Fifteen people were no more than one year post-onset. The largest group of 44 people was from 2 to 5 years post, while 35 were 6 to 10 years post. The numbers then declined, with 19 people between 11 to 15 years, 9 between 16 to 20 years, and 11 more than 21 years post. For this data, the average was 8.5 years. The median, which is the one in the middle when everyone is lined up from most recent to longest, was 7, but the most frequent number or mode was only 3 years. The difference between the 7 and 8.5 is because several people were outliers or had been affected by RSD for much more than 20 years. In contrast, the three means that most people were still fairly new to RSD. This makes sense because we found people who were on RSD websites and presumably searching for information and or support. Slide 16. For chronic pain patients, one piece of information that doctors ask for at every appointment is What's your pain number on a scale of 0 to 10? It's seen, correctly or incorrectly, as a marker of severity 
and of the impact RSD is having on the patient's daily life. No one in our sample claimed a zero. Only two people claimed a pain number of one, and frequency of responses climbed from there to 31 people nominating a seven. Then it declined slightly with 27 people nominating an eight. Only 9 people said 9, and 18 people picked 10, which stands for the worst pain imaginable. The median and mode were 7, so the curve is fairly normal, but as more people picking higher numbers. This means that more people are around the middle, and fewer people are at either extreme. Given that our sample was online and more people were nominating higher numbers, they may be spending more time online searching for information, and less time fulfilling typical daily adult tasks like cooking or working outside of the home. Slide 17 Of the 133 people who answered, 53.6% have applied for SSDI and 19.76% agreed that they met the ADA definition of disability. This may be another marker of RSD severity. Nina also finds these statistics intriguing because she has not seen such high rates in other groups she has researched or has anecdotally found in other groups. Her hypothesis is that people with RSD are often injured through accidents or medical malpractice. This means they may be involved in litigation, so they may be more likely to go through the process of applying for SSDI or claiming a legal identity because they are already in the court system. After all this in-depth description, who was our sample? Participants were predominantly white middle-aged and living with a fair amount of chronic pain. Slide 19 Pain is more than a simple biological event. It is not just a feeling of bodily damage. It is an experience requiring Okay, I will go back. We're going back to slide 18. <laughs> the disability resulting from RSD's chronic pain creates problems of accessibility. In order to have access to pain medications, individuals need health coverage. They may also need wheelchairs or other supports to move around in the built environment. Their homes, arranged prior to their development of RSD, may be hard to navigate, resulting in mobility problems or the ability to use facilities, including bathrooms and kitchens. Public spaces may become less accessible for the same reason. Even in spaces that meet ADA requirements, the pain itself can inhibit an individual's ability to leave the home, as lighting and changes in temperature can be triggers. Slide 19. Pain is more than a simple biological event. It is not just the feeling of bodily damage. It is an experience requiring a social interpretation. Moreover, pain is not a private, but a shared social experience. Cultural beliefs about pain and disability 
frame how an individual experiences his or her body in pain. While this means that RSD can disrupt an individual's sense of self and social supports, a new narrative can rebuild an individual's life through the creation of new meaning. The body always lives in a cultural, social and physical environment. Meeting individuals with a common pain experience, developing these relations and utilizing them through activism can become the basis for a new positive sense of self with RSD. Slide 20. As part of the social support and disability identity questions, we asked, open quote, approximately how many people, besides yourself, do you know with RSD? Close quote. We initially assumed that it was both an indicator of social support, or lack thereof, as well as an initial step toward group identity and activism. We were surprised to find that our sample was fairly isolated. 50 people replied, that they knew no one, and the numbers decreased from there with only 34 people saying they knew one or two other individuals with RSD, 24 said they knew 3 to 5 people. Nine individuals picked six to ten people, six each picked eleven to twenty, and twenty-one to fifty. Fourteen picked over fifty-one people. For comparison time, Stephanie was probably at the three to five stage, and Nina was at the eleven to twenty stage, partly because she had geographically relocated, so she had people in both states. We were also somewhat confused because we were finding people in online groups. So, how did they not have a sense of connection to the other people online? It raised the question of what do predominantly middle-aged women believe the words, open quote, know someone, close quote, mean in an online context? Apparently, reading someone else's post for medical information isn't enough. In order to get people more involved in online communities, foundations, and or activism, these non-relationships need to be strengthened. Otherwise, without a group identity, there is not a need for group activism. Slide 21. Similarly, we posted the questionnaire on what we considered to be online support groups and foundation websites that included aspects of social support as well as medical information. Nonetheless, only 65 people said they had ever participated in an online support group, 35 had gone to in-person groups, and only 16 had done both. Again, this is more isolation than we assumed. Slide 22. Although our sample seems isolated, if we look at the activism they have done, over 50% have donated money, become a member of a foundation, read websites, or participated in other RSD research. This time, we believe that they were using our definitions. 100% said that they read RSD websites, 73.5% had joined foundations, and slightly over 50% have donated money or done other research besides ours. If we look at absolute numbers, 
One hundred people mentioned membership, and seventy-six had donated money. In terms of activities that are higher effort, but potentially also higher impact, thirty-three had raised money, fifty-three had written officials, and twenty-three had even lobbied. Excuse me one second, I just need to take a sip of water. <laughs> At that time, the main RSD Foundation, open bracket www.rsdsa.org, close bracket, had information about resolutions that had been passed in various states to raise RSD awareness and or educate medical professionals. So, the information exists, but lobbying is up to individuals. Nina has not lobbied for RSD causes but has for IBD research funding and policy changes. The difference is that the main IBD foundation organizes lobbying days in DC, trains members in person, and schedules all the visits to the congressional offices. Additionally, New York already had a resolution by the time she was injured. While SD doesn't have a resolution, the political climate is probably not conducive. Slide 23. We included this slide to show that some of our participants were engaged in various kinds of activism, even if not the majority. For example, some route officials are lobbied to raise awareness for RSD. Slide 24. Safe communities in which individuals will... <laughs> Apologies. I will start again. Safe communities in which individuals with RSD can share their experiences are vital for the creation of new self-narratives with RSD. In such communities, individuals become experts of their own pain and recovery as they, for example, exchange strategies for improving their quality of life. The recognition that others understand their pain through empathic communication empowers individuals to listen to their bodies, which have often been dismissed by medical professionals. Moreover, as a community, individuals with chronic pain can create communal narrative strategies for responding to stereotypes of drug seeking or malingering, for example. Together, they can demand respect for the pain that is not merely in their heads. Slide 25. An online environment is an ideal location for building this kind of supportive community, because individuals with RSD are not centralized in any one geographic location. The internet allows individuals to transcend the limits of space and accessibility. Online groups and forums become places for support, friendship, and political strategizing. Moreover, these communities can empower communities to powerfully demand support for research beyond the biomedical model, which addresses their daily lives and experiences, and also for public awareness campaigns to combat stereotypes. Already in Facebook groups and YouTube videos, people with RSD, known as open quote, RSD angels, close quote, help one another live with their pain and share important information for friends and family. Slide 26. In addition to the benefits to individuals, community support helps non-profit disease foundations political work.
However, because of the nature of these foundations, the open quote diseased close quote discourse focuses on four aspects. First, they are categorical, meaning they focus on individual diagnostic categories. This, for example, is why we have to limit our research to RSD instead of chronic pain in general. Second, research primarily uses the medical model, which means that research focuses more on treatment and cure than a disability studies framework. This focus on research and cure is their primary mission, but because they bring together a group of individuals who care about RSD, Foundation can secondarily provide educational information and social support. Slide 27. What can these foundations do to help individuals with RSD? They can focus more on encouraging people through mentoring and isolation, social relationships and end their isolation. Additionally, foundations can be more effective by being specific about their needs and activities in either virtual or open quote real close quote worlds. For example, they need to tell potential participants that they need help stuffing envelopes, circulating awareness information, and links or raising money. At the same time, they need to be aware of and sensitive to the price that individual volunteers pay for their activist work. For example, individuals with chronic pain may have limited energy and strength for daily activity and any activism they do may I will read that last sentence again. For example, individuals with chronic pain may have limited energy and the strength for daily activity and any activism they do may deplete those resources. There are however benefits of volunteering, primarily the foster of engaged social relationships that also result from volunteer work. Slide 28. We are excited about the possibility of using Second Life to create support communities for individuals with RSD. We hope to learn about this from you. We were surprised in our data to learn that while many of our participants use online RSD resources, most of them responded that they barely knew anyone with RSD. We are wondering if this means that they do not count online friends as open quote, real close quote friends or if they are not engaged in their online communities. Also with our study, we offered an alternative for a phone interview instead of the internet survey because some people with RSD have difficulty typing and using a a computer. We aren't sure if the people who opted for the phone interview are aware of the assistive technologies that would help them use Second Life. Slide 29. In our future research we would like to broaden our project to look at how... I'll start again. Slide 29. In our future research, we would like to broaden our project to look at how the use of ADA accommodations is related to disability identity, positive or negative. We also want to examine what kinds of accommodations help individuals with RSD, 
because they can be different than other disabilities and there is not yet research in this area. RSD is just asking Gentle, how do we make them more aware? Gentle's responding, we can talk after this. And I will continue on with the Speakeasy Hugs words here. We are currently working on analyzing the responses we are got to our good day and bad day questions with the hopes of evaluating factors that contribute to quality of life with RSD. Finally, we're also interested in ways that we, as researchers, can help build a thriving RSD community based on a sense of pride. This includes sharing our research like we are today, but also exploring the use of virtual arts and community activism. That is the end of our presentation. Our references are on the next two slides. Thank you for your assistance. Roxy asks, no men, she's been involved in pain groups. There are men out there who are suffering just as much. Do you want to speak about the gender issue? All right, folks, write down those emails because you need to talk to these two ladies. You know who I'm talking about. Roxy, those are important things to say. I have a longer question. What's the best way to explain to doctors, and the doctors will understand they have to diagnose based on medical criteria, what's the best way to explain the pain isn't just in your head? It took 30 years from my first symptom until I was eventually diagnosed with MS. The doctors kept telling me those symptoms were all in my head, and I have to admit they were right, but those lesions in my brain not made the pains. So how do we patients prove these symptoms are real? Snazzy says, have you ever met another person in Second Life RSD? They've only been in Second Life a couple of days. Uh, she has said, said she has RSD from a knee surgery because it's not something they share outside of this auditorium. And then it spread during a cast change when her ortho accidentally broke her ankle, a complete fracture of both bones, the tibia and the fibula. She's been fighting RSD since 1997. She was only 26 years old at, the full, at that time, a full time grad student. She was told by the Mayo Clinic that amputation was spread. The mayor told her she was one of the worst cases they've ever seen. People who walk past me have to walk slow because her skin when they walk past her. She would be open to amputation if she knew 100% it would not spread and would give her her life back. I think what you've done, Dr. Slotin and Dr. Jenkins, is to emphasize the importance of community for people who have any sort of low incidence disabilities. I believe that virtual Worlds are one way that we can form a community, even when we're wise out with geography. And that's certainly pertinent to the topic of this conference, which is Let Me In. And you're talking about Let Me In to a community of peers. I also want to thank our audience. And this is something that many of us in the audience know. It took a lot of teamwork to get this information out to you today. We rely on people with different. Some of us could talk, some of us couldn't, some of us could hear, some of us could click the speakeasy. So between all of us, we got it done. And I congratulate the audience, and, and I'm very happy that we were able to have this information for you. I really hope that you learned something from this presentation and that you will be able to post on our blog because that's where our presenters know that they have done a good job. I want to acknowledge Ms. Sky once more for her help. She did a lot of scheduling and training and assisting presenters. There's so many details in running a conference, and she did those really well. And Tori, thank you, thank you for reading. There was a lot of medical stuff in there, and you just read it right out. That's really quite a talent that you've got. I appreciate that. That's a great thing to do as a volunteer. And then we've got Kara and Lady Slipper, who have spent all of their day here helping with the greeting. 
And I also recognize Dusa and Metaverse TV. They've been filming and streaming, and they're going to be live. So this session, I think we have to declare it officially over because we have a panel coming in very soon. And there's some members of the panel that are coming in. So we can take a short break and get ready for the panel. Ladies, thank you so much for coming and presenting. I know it's just a brand new environment for you, and I think you kind of see some of the positives from it.